So um, I work at a company called Cloudflare, which is a startup, or it's getting to the point now where it's so large we shouldn't be calling it a startup. Um, and we have a logging, well, we did have a logging problem, and now we don't have one, but we do have 10 trillion other problems, which are our log lines. And to sort of give you an idea of what Cloudflare does, we have three offices, one in London, one in, uh, in San Francisco. We have San Jose in here because we have servers there, and one in Singapore. But we operate thousands of physical machines. Um, despite being a cloud service, we actually don't use the cloud. We use hardware. Uh, all over the world. So we have data centers all over um, the United States, North America, uh, Europe, Far East, and then uh, obviously in the Southern Hemisphere, so South America, in Africa, and in Australasia. And those data centers are where you go if you visit quite a lot of popular websites. So for example, I imagine some of you have been to Reddit. Uh, when you actually go to Reddit with your browser, you hit one of those data centers. And Cloudflare looks at the data to see if you're an attacker. And it accelerates it, so it'll choose an appropriate protocol depending on your device. It will cache data, um, so it'll, it'll be able to provide you things from cache rather than directly from Reddit itself, for example. Um, and it will then generate a log line. And that log line will get sent back to our top secret data center in Cheyenne Mountain. Uh, well, not actually in Cheyenne Mountain, but I've used that as the secret location of the data center. And there's a log line with some information about there was a visit to this website, uh, there was an attack perhaps, if there was some sort of an attack, if you were, if you were doing something evil, um, timing information about how long we spent doing it, all that sort of stuff. And of course this happens all the time. So in fact, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these lines hitting us all the time from all over the world to the point at which it looks like nuclear war. And the people who operate uh, that data center for looking at log lines have this problem. Um, basically, the log lines are coming. And the log lines are coming very, very, very fast. And so they're coming at about a rate of roughly 10 trillion a month. So to give you an idea, that's such a large number that's hard to uh, understand. It's actually about 4 million per second. So there's 4 million log lines a second hitting that data center uh, from around the world essentially 24 hours a day because, unfortunately, people wake up when the sun is around and they start using the internet and sending us log lines. And we joke internally that we're actually a log processing company that happens to run a CDN and a security service because uh, one of our biggest problems is how do you deal with these logs? Now, we say a log processing company because we don't actually store them. So there are reasons why we don't store them. The number one reason is size. Uh, to give you an idea, that's 400 terabytes per day, uh, which is 146 petabytes a year, and that's compressed. Um, so there's no way we, would, we could really afford to do it. Uh, in 1985 floppies, that's 120 billion, 22 billion floppies uh, yes. per year. So we, have, uh, we, have, we don't have enough floppies for all this stuff. Uh, the number two reason is privacy. Uh, most people don't want us to store logs. Right? They don't want to actually have logging about what you know, an IP address saw at any one time. And in fact, neither do we, because then nobody can come to us and say, give us all the logs, because we haven't got them. The other really big problem with logs is that um, they're mostly noise. So if you get four million log lines per second, uh, most of that you don't care about at all. It's usually nonsense. Somewhere in there is a bit of a signal. It might be that a botnet has just woken up and has started attacking a website. Uh, for example, Eurovision Song Contest uses us and they get attacked. Some people don't like the Eurovision Song Contest, strangely enough, and they attack its website. So you might see a botnet wake up when a particular country starts singing uh, for geopolitical reasons. So there's some sort of signal in there. But mostly it's just a bunch of essentially meaningless stuff that we don't need to, to keep. And so there's no point doing it, but what we have to do is extract signal from it uh, in real time, essentially, because we can't keep it all. And the sorts of signal things that we end up looking for are, well, there are three really big things. Our customers want us to draw charts for them. So if you put a website on Cloudflare, there's about two million websites, you want to be able to log in and see a picture showing this many requests went through. This is how much bandwidth Cloudflare delivered. This is how much came from cash, statistical information about that. You don't actually want to see the individual log lines. 
So we have to do some sort of roll-ups. The other thing is the customers really want to know about specific attacks. So if somebody attacks your website, um, that may be volumetric, in which case that's just a graph, but it may also have interesting information. So we have a product which is a web application firewall, which we're looking for things like SQL injections or um, cross-site scripting or other things that attacking a website. For example, when the shell shock vulnerability came out, there were a whole, you know, eventually people lit up trying to use shell shock to break into things, and we could show people, okay, this many of those happened, and actually show the individual requests. So this is, this is what was happening. So people want to know about attacks. So in that great noise of data, there is attack information. And we want to protect our customers, and that means spotting an attack. So that might mean spotting something new and anomalous, you know, a particular URI on a particular website suddenly gets really, really popular and gets popular for bad reasons. It's not ended up on Reddit, it's ended up in someone's botnet they want to attack, because you know, people will do that. Or it might be that a large number of machines, you know, there's some sort of campaign going on where somebody doesn't like something for political reasons and encourages a lot of people to go to a particular page and over and over again load the page. We want to be able to spot those things so we can stop them uh, in real time. Um, but bearing all this in mind, we're doing about four million of these per second, four million log lines. So what happens is uh, we show customers things like this. This is my website last month. You can log in and you can see, oh, there was a big peak of traffic here and there weren't, there weren't very many attacks. And so they can get that kind of roll-up information and they can get that rapidly. But they can also look at a specific attacks. So this is just in the UI. This was, I attacked myself just for the fun of it. Um, so they can see, oh, this happened you know, three minutes ago, this particular IP address, uh, you know, try to attack your website, in this case with a cross-site scripting. And you can drill down and you can say, oh, okay, so, you know, what, what was that exactly? Where was it? We saw it in San Jose. It was this user agent. Here's what somebody tried to do. Something kind of stupid, which is try to be bad, script alert, something or other. And that got blocked. So there's that kind of information which is fairly detailed. It's not quite like a roll-up. So originally, we, this was a disaster. And as the data got larger, we had to do something about it. And the solution we came up with uses a lot of open source software, mostly glued together with code written in Go. So things that we really love are uh, Nginx and LuaJIT. That turns out to be a very, very powerful combination. Uh, Captain Proto. Captain Proto, really nice format for moving data around. Apache Kafka. Uh, Kafka is great for queuing things. Um, Redis. Now, I was going to say more about Redis, and then I realized that Salvatore is speaking immediately after me. And whatever I would say would sound completely stupid. So I will just say that it's amazing. And, uh, you, <laughs> and you should listen to him. Um, we use Go extensively, as Cloudflare has talked about a lot. We make a great deal of use of Postgres. So we use Postgres for everything from customer data, like you know, their name and address and all that kind of information, to their configuration information, to data about their website, so analytical data. And we do that actually using a thing called CitusDB, which I will talk about. And we love streaming algorithms because we can't store anything. And we like streaming algorithms we can do really, really fast. So you know, here what we're talking about is data is flying by. Are we trying to pull some signal out of it using streaming algorithms? I'm not going to talk about Redis, and I'm not going to talk about Go because uh, we've talked about Go quite a lot. If anybody's interested, our blog has everything we've said about Go on it. So Nginx and LuaJIT, let's talk about that. Nginx obviously is very, very well known as a great web server, and we use it as a reverse proxy. So if you visit a popular website that uses us, then you hit an Nginx instance, which is going to act as a cache, and also, if necessary, go back to the real origin web server to get the request. When you've got about two million websites sharing the same infrastructure, you need to, on the fly, be able to look at the host header and say, what's the configuration for this particular website? Because every website will choose different config. Um, the way we do that is with Lua. So essentially the, the guts of the Cloudflare solution are a lot of Lua code, some of it handwritten, some of it automatically generated, which are going to load the configuration for that website and as, you know, inside the HTTP request, decide what, you know, what should be applied to this. Should there be some sort of redirection going on? Should this, you know, which features are turned on and off? Because every customer chooses whatever they want to do. Um, LuaJIT itself is very, very fast. It's very good at, at, first of all, jitting the code. We've done a bunch of work to improve it. Um, and we also generate a bunch of code 
the reason we do this is we use a DSL internally to generate rules, and then we spit out Lua. So we treat the Lua as a kind of, well, P-code or machine language. If you have not used it, I do recommend looking at it. It's a very good solution for customization. And that's the, the open source module there. So actually, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is our actual configuration for the firewall. So this is saying that every request going to slash, i.e. any page at all, is going to load a module, that's the require WAF, which is our firewall module, and run it. And then it, because it's running in what's called the access by Lua uh, phase, is basically before the request is actually handled, we'll actually see whether we are allowed to do this request. And if we inspect it and we discover something like the cross-site scripting I tried to do earlier, then it can return a 403 at this point and block, block the request. Now within that, that execution, there are thousands and thousands of rules actually being executed to look for the sorts of attacks that um, people do on websites. And so that's all done with this generated code. The generated code looks something like this. It's a little hard to read, but it's, it's sort of meant to be hard to read because it's essentially machine code. But it's try this, try this, try this, examine this. You know, thousands of regular expressions, thousands of rules run against the thing. And we run that, to give you an idea of the speed, in under a millisecond. So on every request, there's under a millisecond of latency being added to the HTTP request to actually do all that work. And that's running, um, you know, there's a fairly, fairly easy to write this code because it's a fairly high level language. Now to go back to the logging problem, once all these things have happened, maybe the thing has been blocked, maybe it's being allowed to uh, go through to either the cache or to the end user server, we have to send back some information to get into that stream for analysis. Um, so what happens is, there is a Go program, a bit like Hecka, which receives log events from Nginx in Captain Proto format. And I'll talk about Captain Proto in a moment. It batches them up. And then what it does is it uh, compresses them using LZ4 and sends them via a TLS connection to our data store. So that's, that's data center in uh, Cheyenne Mountain there. Uh, we, have, we have essentially permanent TLS connections between our POPs sending data continuously because we're sending four million uh, a second across that. And we found that the combination of Lua, Captain Proto, LZ4 compression works great. TLS really doesn't add much overhead at this point. Everything's very highly compressed. Captain Proto is uh, insanely fast if you need to serialize something. It's both a wire format and an in-memory representation. So there's no, there's essentially, there is no serialization, deserialization step. You just say, here's some data, and you splat it across the wire. Uh, it's very good at dealing with extensions. So one of, of course, the classic things that happens with logs is that you, you write some logging thing. You've got your schema for your log, and then you go, oh, yeah, now we've added this feature. And we need to log some information about that. Or somebody says, can we output timing information about this part of the Cloudflare service? Uh, that's another, you know, a double or a UID64 or something we want to add to that structure. And what Captain Proto allows us to do is just to extend in a nice way without any penalty. So we don't have to go off and re you know, redo absolutely everything to add an extension. We extend in one place and, and we're done. It does use a kind of fixed format. So it tends to allocate lots of space for things rather than trying to trying itself to be as compact as possible. So it does something a bit like a structure alignment where things are aligned with a lot of space in them. Uh, but you put LZ4 on it and potentially all that empty space disappears. And we, we've benched this against Google protocol buffers. Uh, originally we were using CJSON, which is, which is fast, but I mean it was, it was ridiculous for what we were doing. And this, is, this turns out to be really fast. And one of the things we did was there wasn't a, a connection with Lua. And so we open sourced a direct connection from Lua. So if you have Lua code and you want to create a, a message uh, using Captain Proto, you can, and you can just send it across on the wire. Now, on the other side, um, that TLS connection is obviously connecting to our data platform, and we need to receive it somewhere. And we receive it into Apache Kafka. Now, what we need is a, essentially a queue of data that consumers can read from in order to do the analytical roll-ups, in order to look for attacks, in order to save things that customers want saved for those you know, attack events so they can dig into it. And so we need a large queue. And um, a, as I said, a day is about 400 terabytes replicated. It's about 150 terabytes of actual just raw compressed data. So it, 
gets challenging to be able to ingest that and then operate on it on a single machine. And what Kafka allows us to do is build a cluster that acts as a queue that gives us the ability to ingest and actually do analysis on the queue. Um, it is scalable. We can add nodes as this, as this data rate goes up. And it's very resilient, so we can lose, because the data is replicated, the queue, we don't, we don't lose things from the queue. It also allows us to do something really important, which is screw up royally. So if everything else goes wrong, we have this queue, right? We can start pushing stuff into the queue, and if the things that are consuming it have all broken for some reason, um, then we've got some literally buffer space where we can fix stuff. Um, and, for the, and it's for that reason that we essentially keep 24 hours in the queue. Because then, if, we, if it all goes crazy, we, we've at least got those 24-hour window. We don't think we could do this on a single machine. Originally, we were doing some things on a single machine. It was very challenging. And also, we have an ever-growing list of things that would like to examine these log lines as they pass through before they're discarded in order to do analysis. So, you know, you've got the analytical roll-ups, but people throughout the company looking at, particularly at attacks, will say, this type of analysis would be useful. I want to be able to run something on the queue. And so the way they do that is they write pretty much always Go, which runs in a large cluster of hardware, then in analyzing the data as it comes in. Um, so Kafka has worked out very, very well for us. On the other side, once you got into the Kafka queue, we have a cluster of machines that are running what we call aggregators, which are things that are reading the topics as they come off the Kafka queue and doing analysis. And this is quite a large cluster. There's over 100 physical machines. Uh, doing this as we do things. And ultimately, for the analytics, what we do is we feed aggregate information, roll-ups, into Postgres. At the same time, we're generating detailed attack logs for customers, so they can look at that, they can drill down into that. And for some customers who are at the very, very high end, they actually want copies of the logs, we'll be sending them a copy. So there, there may be some people who would like a consolidated log, because the one bad thing about going to something like a CDN that's doing caching is you lose visibility of what got actually hit on your website because you no longer got the equivalent of an, you know, an Apache log somewhere. So for some very high-end websites, we actually give them that. We'll sort of merge the world back together again and say, here's the data. So if I go back to that attack uh, that we saw, it ultimately can be spat out of the Captain Proto compressed format into a block of JSON. So Within all those Go programs, we're operating on JSON. So we think the Captain Proto is, is what's stored there. It's what comes out as a, as, a, as a topic, as a message from Kafka. But then we can look at that and do, do whatever analysis we feel like. After that, uh, we have uh, Postgres. Now, uh, Postgres, we've used for a long time for doing roll-ups. And we got to a point where with, you know, you've got 2 million people 2 million sites, 4 million uh, log lines per second, um, you have a problem just storing the roll-ups and doing queries on a database of that size. And we came across a Y Combinator company called CitusDB, which essentially has made a sharded version of Postgres that allows us to do very, very fast queries. So if you log into the interface on Cloudflare and ask for, I want the last month of data for my website, that's a live SQL query against our database. And we can do that for you and say, here you go, here's what the graph looks like. And you can see the speed just by trying it yourself. It's also replicated, so it deals very well with failure and the nodes. And uh, we've written this up in great detail about how this, how this operates. But it's all based on, on Postgres itself. Uh, the key idea is that the actual database is sharded across multiple machines. And when a query comes in, it is planned out to run in parallel across the cluster and then results are merged. And this turns out to be a really good match for analytical data because there's there are often quite simple sharding methods based on customers and things like that. So it turns out to be very, very fast. And we get seconds or sub-second queries of quite, quite a large amount of data because you can go back historically and look at, them, look at the graphs. We have hardware built for us by Quanta in Taiwan uh, because of the number of machines we build. This is, a, this is what a typical machine looks like, at least the back of it. Um, it's, it's actually four separate compute nodes in a 2U rack. Uh, the power supply is obviously in the middle. So each of those is a separate, separate machine, essentially. Uh, each compute machine is 128 gigabytes of RAM. And we've got 16 cores without hyperthreading, so 32 if you hyperthread, uh, in each of those nodes. So 64 physical cores in a 2U, 2U rack. 
uh, 10 gig Ethernet, and then disks vary depending on whether this is within our cluster being used for storing database information or the Kafka queue or as a compute node. In general, the database has the biggest disks, Kafka smaller because it's sharded over many machines, and then the compute nodes have very little disk at all because they tend to be running something like Redis and keeping track of a certain amount of information. So we had, to give you an idea of the scale, we have 40 machines like this running Kafka. So that's 20U, 20U high. Um, and they have, they, they're ingesting at about 15 gigabits per second constantly. And there's about 50 terabytes of disk. And we're using spinning disks here. So these are, this is just fine for spinning disks because this is not, we don't have, we don't have this quite the same kind of read-write stuff. This is, a, uh, Kafka is, is appending to a log, it's a commit log style, so it's appending and it works very nicely for that. The Citus DB, which is doing analytics for two million customers, uh, that's much larger, that, so, so it's much larger in terms of um, overall disk. So there's 15 terabytes of SSDs, um, and that's only on five machines. So it's essentially one of these plus an extra compute node, which allows us to do that. And then we have about somewhere over 100 machines that are doing all of the Go processes you could imagine. So if you have any Go thing you, know, you want to write, we, we have that, and that's controlled right now through a combination of, it was originally statically, we knew it was machine things were running on, it's now been moved pretty much all to Docker and Mesos. So we can arbitrarily run things, and depending on the workload. At particular times of day, you may have a greater workload. For example, uh, although we operate globally, uh, we tend to see a peak of traffic when Europe and the US are awake, overlapping each other. So you'll see the actual, you know, the load here go up and you want to do, you want to maintain a certain latency through, through the log pipeline. Streaming algorithms. So one of the problems with not being able to look at data uh, across, you know, years or days is that you need to process things on the fly. It'd be, it'd be very tempting to be able to say, I'd like to go back and do some analysis. What was, you know, how heavily was this URI hit? Or what did this IP address do? We can't do it, but we, so we rely on some streaming algorithms to do calculations for us. And there are really a couple of things that are essential. Uh, one of them is to be able to do frequent or top N. What's the busiest IP address hitting us right now? That might be, you know, some sort of machine that's gone haywire as part of a bot. Or um, on a particular website, is there a particular URI that's gone crazy? If there is, it could be an attack. It could be something that needs caching differently. You know, we have things, many of the Super Bowl ads, the people who were on the Super Bowl ads beforehand signed up for Cloudflare, you know a particular URI is gonna go crazy, we're gonna spot that, we might change the caching rules on the fly. So you want to efficiently be able to, from this stream of data, figure out what's you know, top N elements in all sorts of def definitions of elements. Uh, another, another sort of top N is you'll see attacks against login pages where people are trying over and over and over again different usernames and passwords. They will tend to come from a single IP address. So you can start to say, oh, that's a busy IP address there. Let's see what it's doing. Oh, it's hitting slash login with a bunch of invalid logins. Um, so we use a thing called the space saving algorithm, which you can get from this particular report. It's very simple to, to implement and is very good as long as your data isn't too long tail. So one of the problems we've seen with space saving is that what I mean by long tail is because we have two million websites, there'll be some websites which are um, fairly infrequently hit, like my blog, for example. And uh, space saving is great if you have a lot of data about, it's relatively compact, it's relatively normally distributed. If, you, if it becomes very, very spread out, then it tends to, uh, over, or not a nice normal distribution, it tends to not work quite so well. The other one is we just want to know how many distinct things there are. How many distinct IPs, users, are hitting this website. How many distinct URIs on this website are hit? So hyperloglog is extremely good for that. Um, we use a variant based on this open source thing. We've open sourced our version of it. Um, so that's available if people want to do hyperloglog. That's one of those algorithms that you read about and you think that can't possibly work. And then amazingly it does when you, have, when you want to count things without counting every individual, every individual element. For some things we do want to actually count individual things and we use Redis for that. Uh, lots of what I've talked about is open sourced. Uh, we have this uh, Cloudflare open source page. Um, you can go there and see around Lua, around Postgres, around Go. The, the main things we haven't open sourced are some of the aggregators, which are doing actual attack analysis, for example, um, because that's essential to our business. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>